Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Let's jump into this week's interview. Oh my goodness, everyone. It's been a month. So as you know, uh, it's been a month since the last episode. Um, I decided to switch to monthly, so we'll probably keep it that way. I want to go deeper with these episodes, and I also want to be sure that I can stay regular with it. So this is the best way for me to do that until at least until I grow a bit more and it'll be worth it to possibly pay for help and I get more interesting guests, which I'm always working on. So this month, enjoy this visit that I had with Michael Miller. I've known Michael for at least 10 years. He's what you would call an entrepreneur. I just call it having a servant's heart. Uh, That's a less French way of saying it. Uh, He's currently running an operation called Fox Hanks. And we're about to talk some serious, serious detail about his life and work here. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is how you live your daily life. We didn't get to talk. Well, actually, we did talk dollar amounts, which I think would have been very helpful for you to hear. But Michael isn't comfortable with that. So I honored his request and I took out all those details. So if that makes this too boring for you, then I'm very sorry. Um, I still do think that it's a very fruitful discussion. We were sitting at a cafe, so the background noise does get kind of loud for a few sections of our conversation. Just a fair warning on that. Here we go. How you been doing? What you been up to? Work, work, more work. Getting ready for twins. Yeah? Yeah. Twins. Is it uh, identical? Twin or? identical girls. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. When do they do? July. Oh no, they're due July, but they'll come in June, like June twentieth ish. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Big keeping us real busy. But. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. So, what have you been up to with business? Um, getting ready. We have a big show in June, the first week in June, but we won't be able to attend. Uh, so we're just getting ready, preparing uh, the work, and then talking to some friends that are going to be manning the show for us and dropping off stuff. Okay. So what are you having to deal with, like, day-to-day? So we don't have a, we're not going to have a table at this event. So we work with about 60 different companies uh, doing branded work. So we make a product with their logo on it, pay them royalties if we sell it online. But for shows like the big show that we're working on, get preparing for, um, it's just a lot of work to get the branded product to them, to their table. They sell it, and then we settle up at the end of the show, take back whatever doesn't sell, and then sell that on our website. So okay. And that's knives? That's No, just handkerchiefs. Ha- just handkerchiefs. Yeah. Okay. So we've, we've started... Uh, 100% just anchors is what we work on, but it's with knife companies that we're working with branding. Um, okay. We've got companies that are, each knife they sell comes with a handkerchief um, talk, and talks with some larger companies that are wanting to do larger runs. Um, 
just it's been growing. It's a small market, but it's our market, yeah. and we own it. So yeah, so. you're pretty much it, right? Yeah. No, there's there's about probably 20 different companies doing it, but we're top dog, and as long as we stay top dog, we're good. So okay. I just worry about production. Worry about um, make sure that we have we have two employees that work for us uh, part time. Uh, there's both one's a stay at home mom, one's a stay at home grandmother, and they pick up products each week, and then they work at home, and they bring it back, and then bring pick up new stuff. So I do make sure that that production is going good, and that we meet our deadlines for shows, and then um, we make about 70 to 150 handkerchiefs a week, um, and then. What are y'all? What are y'all dealing with right now? Are you trying to get that a, a more automated process, or is it like a big thing that we they're have handmade? it automated? Um, as far as like us touching it, we're trying to make it where we have products that aren't made by us. Uh, so we're working with a company in San Antonio that's going to be screen printing some product for us, and um, we'll be buying buying handkerchiefs and buying um, bandanas and having them screen printed. Uh, so the, the handkerchiefs that we're doing are two sided. So we'll do a one layer version that's screen printed, and then we'll also do um, larger bandanas that are like 22 by 22 screen printed. Okay. So, like, are, do you have any goals with the business right now, or is it pretty much right going now faster babies. than you can set set uh, it's, plans it's, for? It's plateaued is where where we want it. Uh, we're figuring out how to make it where it's got some more growth to it. Um, so you're, you're plateaued now, or you're trying to get it to where it sort of plateaus itself, and then you can sort it's of step back It's plateaued as far as, like, production, as far as demand and stuff like that. We found where it, where our numbers are, and we're sticking with that. The big, the big ups and downs of the shows that we have where, um, like, they're showing... In Atlanta, we'll be on like 35, 40 tables, um, but we won't have a table there at present. Uh, right. We'll just have... You're sort of the subcontractor for all the much. other people that are already yeah. there doing yeah. stuff. Yeah, so that's a good thing. There, we usually do have a table of our own there. It's just with the babies coming, we don't have the ability to man it. Right. Um, so really right now, we're just focused on making sure the babies are taken care of, the house is good and stuff like that. The business is running itself. It takes a couple days of my time and I'm um, like... It takes four days of my time full time, and then probably a day and a half of Mary's full time. Uh, so once the babies get here and we get back to normal as far as like uh, taking care of them and everything, and mm-hmm. figure out how to how to make some shortcuts, obviously in our business, I want to um, create another business where I'm uh, buying and selling wholesale, selling retail. Uh, from the companies that we work with and other companies in this industry. Okay. So the everyday carry flashlight knives, um, stuff like that. So. What kind of stuff and are you having to do to get to, to get ready for the kids? Um, moving stuff around in the house, getting it ready. It's a big transition to change a whole are, house. From, are you all still in the same house that you were in last yeah. time I was there? Yeah, it's a big transition to change a house from two single uh, two people with no kids to two people with, with two, two kids. kids. Yeah. yeah. So just getting it ready, trying to figure out how we want to man it. Um, luckily, our upstairs, which was our master bedroom, is now production. So um, there's a loft on the end of that. We're going to have that as a place for the kids to stay. And it'll make it where we can keep an eye on them and still be able to work. Mm-hmm. It's been working out really well. Um, God bless us with the ability to get the house when we got it. And shoot, we got it a month before we got married. So it just worked out perfectly. Nice. And this is five years down the road, and it's still like where we're supposed to be. How's how's everything else? Good. I've learned a lot. I met a guy about a year ago. It sort of changed my ideas a lot about business. I, I realized how selfish of a business person that I was mm-hmm. um, up until probably about two years ago, um, and then another change a year ago, and then another change a few months ago, and learn all this stuff you know as I go with nobody to teach me I'm having to learn all this stuff yeah, yeah find bits and pieces as I go along make mistakes figure out what solutions to certain problems are so what are you doing in real estate uh, drone work so trying to help people it basically okay, so an aspect of marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. For- photography aerial photography yeah. so yeah basically just trying to help people sell their houses faster and attract higher paying buyers yeah yeah because as you know, if people are scrolling by on MLS, they've got like two seconds to. They, they're looking at that thumbnail before they're passed. So mm-hmm. it's like my goal is to get people to stop scrolling, to and look book at a showing, yeah. to look at a house and make yeah. a purchase. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's how I. Uh, that's changed a lot because before people would ask me, "Well, what do you do?" And I'd be like, "Oh, I do media production." Didn't really have a specific thing. I was really general. 
yeah, yeah. you know. But then as soon as I start talking about how I translate that into a result for somebody else, I mean, it's like driving a car. I don't have to know how the transmission works. Yeah. I know I turn the key, I put it in gear, and I press the gas pedal. I don't need to know the measurements. Everything. Yeah. I don't need to know the measurements and the pressure that or about the, the upholstery, the the fuel line's supposed to be at, and all yeah. this type of stuff. You're uh, focusing on what you do best, and if that's what that's what works, and you find the demand for that. Make it easy for me to where yeah. I don't have to think. Exactly. I, it's you know turnkey. Yeah. Type that's of nice. stuff. So yeah, um, then there's a few different applications that I'm that I'm sort of pursuing and figure out which one does well. So real estate's one of them. Uh, chiropractic and massage therapy is another application for video production, and I still do like independent films and stuff every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. You still doing weddings or is that like? Gosh, I haven't done one in probably a couple of years. Good. I usually did one about once every year. So I never really focused on it. They just sort of dropped to my lap and I'd take them if I could. Yeah, yeah. But it's never something it's I wanted headache. to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. The people that want wedding photography, and this is another thing that I learned in business, was you really have to put some serious mental effort into the results for the other person. Mm-hmm. Whether you think it's important or not, and if you if you and the customer both think it's important, then that's great. But there are a lot of people that it, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Yeah. Sometimes you can lay down your own desires on behalf of the wants and needs of your customers, and you still do quite a bit of money. Even though I could care less about super duper fancy schmancy weddings. Yeah. Most of the people that are in do video production for fancy schmancy weddings don't care about it either. But they're like, it doesn't matter what I think; it matters what my customers think, and they yeah. make like fifty grand a wedding. For the super duper high end stuff, yeah, be nice. not the world that I wanted to be in. I've got different, mm-hmm. uh, different desires and goals. Yeah, yeah. The type of people that I want to help. That's cool. Cool. I've always wanted to go into real estate, but uh, hindsight, I wanted to go into real estate as a as a kid and as a young adult. I was not, or shoot, I am a young adult, but as a kid and as starting off working, I wasn't interested in it. But then uh, my grandfather had always been in real estate, and my great grandfather had been in real estate, and my dad was in real estate for a while too, and it just would have been it would have been cool to try my hat at, at it, but it just never it's, ended up working out. It's one of those industries where the sky's the limit. Yeah, the people that are the richest people in the world they're in like real estate mm-hmm. investing. Yeah, and so yeah, it's something that totally runs the gamut. And same thing with uh, just like money in and of itself, mm-hmm. loans and when you finally get to the end game stuff it's like straight up like money money investing in businesses and like building assets and stuff like that building businesses that don't require your presence anymore you can just hand it off to somebody else and just brings you money every month without you having to do anything but yeah real estate and uh, business building are the two most complicated and hardest to get into fields just because there's so many details for sure yeah entrepreneurship and serving your customers and that's a very theological issue yeah, serving people sure. and money and how you deal with money and treat people as employees is a lot of biblical principles that you have to draw from to do it well employees yeah. become very difficult you get people that uh, want to work for you that want to make money and then once they start doing it it just creates money it has issues no matter how, how you spend it how You're many employees are you dealing with right now right now we have uh, three we have two part-time that work all the time, and then one that's kind of like uh, all of our big uh, wholesale orders. We'll we'll send to this one person. That way, we don't have to mess with our current gravy train, which is good numbers, good stream that we know we know we're keeping. Our, like I said, our plateau. Um, so. One's in Wichita Falls, one, and then the other two. Are, are they officially here. employees or are they subcontracted? They're uh, subcontracted, 1099. That we, do, we don't worry about anything like that. They worry about their own paychecks. They worry about their own taxes and everything. So we pay them piecework um, just the way we s- structured our business, and it worked out well for us. Um, we've gone through one, two, three, four, four other employees, and it just it's created some more good Separations and others didn't didn't end as well. Have you had, so you've had a like a lot of turnover or just a few people? We've, we've had seven employees in the in the course of a three year business. So um, I don't think that's too much. But it doesn't sound like yeah. that much of a headache. And we had employees whenever we started. It, we didn't start as just the two of us. So over the course of three years. Uh, we've lost four employees, uh, either because we were paying them too much and we had to adjust that and they weren't. They wanted to go find greener pasture somewhere else or um, they thought the pasture was greener than it was. Um, so it's just, 
went our separate ways. Um, most of them are fine, but one lady didn't end up too well, but we tried our best to end it well, and I think we did um, on our side of things. Was she just hard to deal with? She was very hard to deal with, um, just negative about her previous employer. So therefore, it just made it where she was negative about. She it. had some carryover yeah. baggage yeah. from her last job. So it just she thought that this would be easy, where she'd be able to um, not have to do this and do that. And then like we were, we were saying like this is the list of instructions to create this product to our standards, and she added more to the list because she was um, more OCD about things, which is a good thing. It makes good products. But it, it also makes it where you're spending more time. So she was spending some detail time doing this, doing that, doing this, that was incre decreasing her efficiency and making it where her, her she thought she was making She's minimum wage versus the lady that's working for us now is making just as good of a product and is making 23 to $26 an hour. So it's just, that's how it's structured. And we try and structure it where they're making like $17, $18 an hour, which so gives us room for pay bumps. But the lady we have working for us now is just a workaholic. And when she's working, she's focused on working instead of getting distractions, phone calls, doing this and trying to calculate that into her times. So it's, it's just been, we've got, we've got a crew right now that's been really good to us. So we're hopefully going to keep that and then add some more people if it grows. What type of people would you be looking for in the future? We're going to stick with the, the concept we have right now. Stay-at-home moms. We're able to help help ladies that uh, in this community that we know uh, that need to be able to make bring some more income in but not sacrifice a lot of family time where they can still watch their kids and stuff. Um, yeah, it's, that's that's been our gravy train right now. Have you all? How have you found some of your employees in the past? Were they through church or people that you church, already knew? Church and church. Uh, Mary's mom's one of our employees that whenever we need it, uh, but everything else has been through church. Awesome. Yeah. How's y'all's current church situation? Uh, so we were going to a church for five years before we were married and then while we were married, and then it just, uh, it was kind of dead. Uh, so we, we switched recently, last year and a half, and we found a church that has a little bit more energy, more um, people that are encouraging and less depressed and uh, it's been a positive thing for us because uh, we weren't depressed it's just when you're around depressed people it doesn't make it where Sunday it doesn't make Wednesday you feel like you can go encouraging and, and it's encouraging motivating. you to go help yeah. motivate other people yeah. and get them out of the depressed state so um, we we were helping with the young adult ministry at the previous church but now we've, we're helping with the youth um, so it's been a good it's a good thing we're volunteering they're um, helping on Sundays when we can and Wednesdays uh, on a regular basis so it's been really good for us we found a found a good connection I think what are some of the best things and worst things that you see with y'all's current church and then like the American church in general American church in general um, some of the strong points that you see and then maybe the fee, they're just don't care about um, the people in the church that are with them or the people in their community um, the world as a whole I think I think uh, the church specifically needs to be more of an agent for at its current state for community and for the current radius that they're in mm. uh, I think we, we have a lot of old Baptist church that are worried about foreign missions foreign missions foreign missions we're in your towns going to hell in a handbasket um, and I think that if there's more focus on that, then the strength will be there for them to be able to go transition to foreign missions and stuff like that, outside of your bubble. So focus, I think that uh, America's church needs to focus on the town that they're in, the people that are in the pew next to them, or in the chair next to them, and uh, have a passion for that. Uh, you go to a lot of churches, you can go in there, you can sit down, you can listen to a sermon, you can leave, and nobody says, how do you do? or anything. You might have a door open for you, you might not. Um, I think it's important for churches to have a have a warm f feeling, warm face uh, with their staff, with the people that they ask to volunteer. Um, and then with the church I have now, you're asking for problems? Well, like, well so there was a, there, I, I, yeah. hear a, I mean, I agree very much with that problem. Are there any bright spots that you see? Do you feel that y'all's church is a bright spot? Or do you know of other churches around the country that are a bright spot? Uh, my favorite church I ever went to was in Spring, Texas. It was, uh, at the time, I was probably 16, 17, 18. Uh, we'd go and visit there. And it was structured um, 
extremely differently. One of the pastors was a famous speaker, and then they had three, uh, two other pastors as well. Um, so they shared the preaching load, and they shared the responsibilities of helping run the church. Um, and just the way they had it structured was very reverent toward communion, which I think is a, a problem that there is right now. It's just very like, here's, here's crackers, here's, here's a little grape juice, and mm-hmm. take it and be done. Uh, there's, there's less like somber remembrance of, um, of what communion actually has. And the scripture says that if you take this in, uh, with a, in an unworthy yeah, manner, an unworthy manner yeah. uh, people died over that in the, in the New Testament. Um, so it's, it's definitely, in my opinion, that's just a small little tidbit. Um, and then just had a great feeling. Family, it was a little more family-driven, family-based. There was... They weren't um, taking a taking a family and then dividing it into you're going to this Sunday school, you're going to this youth program, you're going to this. It was um, they had things for people to do in their age groups, but it was outside of the Sunday. Mm-hmm. And so Sunday, whenever the dads off work, you were spending time together as a family instead of just splitting off. Yeah. And, um, one of the things that I found interesting is that, like, we were never commanded to meet together on a certain day. Yeah. The Bible never says that. That was something that came out of the Babylonian captivity mm-hmm. because the people didn't have a temple to go to because that was in Israel. They're in, they're in Babylon now, and they can't even... I think there, there there's was no, always... There's not really an opportunity. Well, I think they would, I would do it that, They would do it six days a week, but that when they're slaves in Babylon, I they can't really do it every Shabbat single day. Shabbat, so Saturday, in, in Jewish time, would have more... A gathering together of families and they stuff did that, like that and they would read scripture yeah but that's that's saturday not even sunday that we practice now right um but yeah it's, it's well and it's different i heard a, a guy talking recently he said you work six days a week sabbath mm-hmm. is the day that you stop work and work is work and worship are like the same thing worship is a or work is a kind of worship yes and so you're supposed to worship six days a week and then stop your worshiping on the seventh day. And we sort of have that backwards. We don't think of our everyday work as a type of worship. Yeah. And then we get together and then we only worship once a week. Well, no, that's the day that you're... If you're going to rest once a week, then that's the day that you stop worshiping and you rest in the worship that Christ did on my behalf. I thought that was a really interesting take on it. That is. I hadn't heard of that. I think a lot of people don't really think that there's still a temple that we worship in every day. Like, we're, I'm a living stone in, as a member of the true temple. Mm-hmm. The temple that they used to do animal sacrifices in was a shadow yes, of what we have now. We have the reality of it. And so now every believer is a, is a priest and the sacrifice itself and the temple. So it's like, I don't have to live a few miles away from Jerusalem There's to no have veil access to the temple. Yeah. The veil was torn, yeah. and now Gentiles have been made clean, yeah. and they can enter the temple because we're members of the temple. I just think that's such a neat picture. But you would, they would cease offering animal sacrifices on the Sabbath, mm-hmm. and they would, only, they would offer sacrifices six days a week. So it's like, yeah, I think it's exactly what you're saying about the church being more community stuff and have stuff going on all throughout the week. I think that's a big thing. A lot of a lot of apps and businesses that I see being developed are sort of made to solve the gap that the church has left because there's no community anymore. Yeah. You don't know who in your community like, does such and such, so you got to get on Facebook or you got to get on um, GoFundMe. A- Angie's List. If a or, friend of mine has cancer and he's running a deal on GoFundMe and honestly, like, that's what churches used to be for. They were for the the widow, for the the sick, for the people in need to go to, instead of to go to the welfare state of the government. Right now. now you have to put in an advertisement and hope that people, yeah. rather than having you've you've known these people all your life and you've got them lined up when you just ask, it's like yes, yes. of course, you know, you helped me move in, you know. You were there when I was born. Like, and even I've, if they didn't, even if they're the stranger that just walked in the door, it's a sense of community that you have a have connection together, there yeah. because of how important our shared heirship as brothers of Christ is, mm-hmm. and like that's our identity. You, all these people talking about identity politics and your uh, sexual identity and all this type of stuff. 
Well, yeah. Christians have an identity too, and we have to have a shared identity in our community. I see unbelievers that have stronger communities than Christian churches do, and we're supposed to be the example for everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. I see that as a real problem. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that y'all are trying to be a bright spot. Yeah. I differ very theologically from the church we go to now. Um, I'm very... I do too. I don't agree yeah. 100% with even my own views a year ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm still like Calvinistic and um, Reformed Southern Baptist in a sense. Uh, but whenever I was younger, I, I enjoyed arguing about... Uh, Calvinism versus Arminianism. I'm fed up with that. I'm, I'm, I want to know what are the practical con- discussions that we need to be having. It, it causes conflict, and instead of causing unity, and it causes bitterness and it causes anger, and instead of causing, hey, let's go use our mental energy and our, use our physical time to help somebody else instead of arguing amongst one another. Sometimes you get you- through the list of. Christ died and you can, he uh, is the only way for salvation and the fundamentals of our faith once you once you check those boxes you don't need to worry about the five million other things that you can believe uh, yeah once you have the basics down then you can get into some like some sh- you know sharpening other people how yeah. are you doing in your business how's your work going how's your family those types of things instead of what we, do you think about this or what do you think about this as far as like theologically based it's more practical okay yeah we say we believe all this stuff now how well how good of a job are you doing translating that into how you live your life mm-hmm. every day going back to uh, my side of the business stuff about I can tell you a story about two years ago there's a lady a neighbor of ours she ships horses internationally mm-hmm. I made a video for her she paid me $1,500 I finished it in a couple of days, a couple of days of work, and then we uploaded it to Facebook, and it got over 300,000 views in two weeks. And the equine I th- market is crazy. And I thought, well, jo- you know, job well done. The best thing you've ever done, Adam. Congratulations. And then about two months later, just sort of out of the back of my head, I, had, I asked the question, you should call her and ask her, like, what kind of an impact that's made on her business, like, if she's noticed anything change. Mm-hmm. And I called her and asked her, I said, what kind of, what difference has that made? And she said, I don't know. That's a good question. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Did she just waste $1,500? Because if this was just a feel-good project, yeah. then that's, that's fine. But I would have done things very differently. I probably would have spent less time on it. Yeah, yeah. And made, came away with more money per hour based on what she wanted to pay. But I wasn't thinking to ask the question, okay... How can we track clicks or figure out how well this did? Did you get did you get 20 customers off this video? Yeah. Well, if so, if you made a profit, then we should do this again. Yeah, the analytics. Or yes. if it didn't do anything for you, then you should know not to do that again or do something different. Mm-hmm. But she just didn't know. In which case, she, like, she so has... So $1,500 is thrown into Wonderland. It could have created a wonderful effect and it could have sold... $5 million worth of products, but you don't know that unless you track it well. That makes right. sense. I mean, it's like, how, how often would somebody put some money into the stock market and then forget Not about watch it? it? Yeah. Totally forget about it. Yeah, yeah. It's just, that's when I realized that, okay, a lot of the people that I've been working in, they're really, really small businesses. Mm-hmm. Most of them aren't thinking in that, that sort of terms. Yeah. They're like, a video is cool because everybody else does it, but they don't understand You've how You've got to watch the analytics of it. Yeah, whenever we were, um, we still watch the analytics somewhat closely, um, but we we used to study it a lot harder because it was a lot more interesting um, and it was fun, I guess, was, was why. Um, in our heyday, we were getting um, 150 people on our website to sell 70 products. So majority of the people weren't even going to get anything because uh, a lot of people were buying two threes before one person could check out and buy one uh, those days are gone now we have product on our website all the time i still track our like how much how much uh, traffic we, our website gets and how many people we have during the major times that we try and push our marketing toward um, and we still get our, the numbers that we're needing we get good numbers from um, 10 people sometimes to 50 to 75 people if we do it well, and it's just 
trying to adjust and tweak. So like you're saying in the video, if you don't if you don't look at the analytics of that, then you're then you're not knowing how to improve it, how to do it better next time, or even if it was something that, that benefited you. Uh, we haven't gotten too much into like Facebook ads, marketing and stuff like that, Instagram ads. Uh, we're still just running the guerrilla marketing. Um, our business is there and we're, um, a good, we try to be a good business and be good to our customers and our customers refer us and they advertise for us because we have a product that you can take pictures of. So it's, it's just been, that's how our marketing's kind of geared toward right What's now. been the most effective thing that you've done so far? Where, can you tell where most of your business comes from? Instagram, 100%. Instagram, pictures. People taking pictures, and um, we didn't plan on it being this way. Um, our market's got 300 to 3,000 plus dollar knives and 300 to 3,000 plus dollar flashlights. And they're taking pictures of those with our handkerchief underneath it. And that pocket knife, that flashlight, does not have a brand written on it that you can read. It may have a brand on there somewhere, but it's definitely not something you can visibly read from a picture. Uh, versus ours is text size. It's like, looks like Times New Roman 12 that you can read clear as day that says Fox Hanks. So as soon as they read that, they're able to see and that's what they're able to remember. And then again, we're also making a $35 product for people that are spending $3,000 on stuff. So it's it's the cheapest thing that they're going to buy. So we, we've, uh, we've done very well with that. Uh, just We didn't even plan on it that way, but our, our tag of our products is made where you can read it. I remember Amy telling me about that, that you, that those are expensive to have those embroidered. Yeah, we that's make That's one them of ourselves. the most, most expensive thing, parts of the handkerchief, yeah. that tag. I make it myself. That's still 100% done by me in-house. Every single week, I spend um, a full day at least just making tags for the product that's being made that week. So, we, like, you look at 75 handkerchiefs. Uh, there's four people that are involved in that. Uh, I would do the tags. I do the shipping. My wife does the computer work that's involved for that. Then we have two other ladies that are doing the production side of things with with me uh, because I'm scheduling and I'm doing the tags and I'm doing any other any other needed steps that aren't part of their list. Uh, so it's it's a lot of time invested into one little thing that you can buy at Walmart for three bucks, but we sell for thirty five bucks. So it's just um, I think there is a is more of a value for craftsmanship. Um, in America right now. I don't know if that's going to stay that way, but it's definitely there. Um, not everybody values it. Walmart still does great business, but some people are going more to the central market instead of Walmart because they know that it's going to be better for them or higher grade or this or that or the other. They're trying to find the farmer's market to be able to buy direct from the source instead of going through the list of list of providers just being another another number on the deal they actually make an impact on somebody's lives uh, that's definitely a change in society's like mindset um, it's come through the access to the business um, 10 15 years ago I would never be able to make a living doing what I did because Instagram wasn't there because social media wasn't there you have uh, you'd have to start up doing stuff at trade shows yeah which is I a would, big investment up front. I would have to just do trade shows it would take me three years to make the connections that I made in six months and it would take me another three more years to be able to make it where I'm making enough enough money off of this business to afford one employee instead of right now if you count my wife and I we're at five to six so it's just uh, it's a different world we're living in uh, that has the like your drone shots your drone photography and everything yeah that didn't exist, it didn't exist 10 years, 10 years ago. ago so that is a game changer and, and you have to use the new up and coming to be able to stay on top of the game um, we're at the top of our game out of like I said the 2030 companies that do the exact same thing that we do I don't think any of them are full time or if any of them are full time it's just one person or two people but we whenever we started our business it was our goal to be number one it was our goal to be top seed and we got there in like three or four months because it was hustle and it was work um, the story behind that was I was working for my father-in-law and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law were going to go through a divorce and we took the mother-in-law side of thing and he had the business so I was going to be out of a job no matter what so it was basically like, if this does not make this much money per week, then we're, then I'm going to have to get another 9 to 5. And it was like, okay, this is our chance. So we pushed and we pushed and we pushed. And 
uh, my wife would come to work with me and she would work on the handkerchiefs with her mom inside while I was working outside or making running errands or doing what else for the business and uh, then whenever Whenever that quit, uh, whenever I clocked out, I would go inside and we'd work, and we'd work till 9, 10, midnight, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, go home, get a couple hours sleep, get back in the car, and get back to work at 7 o'clock in the morning. And it was that cycle for like a month and a half, two months, and then it just boomed. We definitely could tell that God was blessing us with it. And then we were like, okay, well, if this is what we're supposed to do, then this is what we're supposed to do. I quit right before the first big trade show we went to. And then it's hit rest is history. From then on, it's hustle, hustle, and just building connections, building relationships, friendships with people in the industry to make it where we work with. We work with knife companies that sell 14 million to 20 million dollars in knives a year, all the way to the person that makes 10 knives a year. So it's just a, a wide spectrum of things. But we're the only people. We're the only company that's working with larger companies like that. There's some people that have made it to like the medium, uh, medium grade, and but they, they never made it to where we are. We're definitely in uncharted territories in our industry. And I don't mind charting a few more. So before the kids come, are you still looking at sort of making this take less and less of your time? And then also after, you need the business to take less of your time, right? Yes. Uh, so the way we have it structured, because it's my wife's in the third trimester with twins, she doesn't have the ability to work very much. The way we have it structured now, I can still maintain. She can spend enough time, we can get people to come over and watch the babies, or I can watch the babies enough for her to be able to do her side of the business. Um, whenever she gets to the point where she can take over some of the roles and some of the tasks that I'm doing, that's whenever I'll transition to be able to open up more doors. But we, we also have um, some other products that are hands-free for us, that are in the works. Those should be two, three months before they're here. So whenever the babies get here, those will come in, and that will make it where we don't have to spend as much time production. Um, but the way we're going to run those is different. So it's, it's not the same thing, but it is. It's money, but it's not as reliable and as consistent because we know what we're doing right now. So what was it that made you want to, I mean, we've known you since, obviously, yeah. back when you were still doing, like, drill bits yeah. and stuff. Before then, you knew me as a, as a kid. Yeah. What made you decide to want to own your own business? Why don't you want to go get a 9-to-5? So I, I, I got into the knife industry as a collector. And um, at a trade show working for my father-in-law in drill bits, I get contacted by a friend, on, a guy on Instagram, random guy on Instagram from Hawaii. And he's like, hey, I'm running a Kickstarter. Let me send you this product. I want you to promote it. And I was like, well, I need to talk to you first because I need to know what kind of person I'm promoting, uh, not just what kind of product. Uh, so I, I talked to him on the phone then for like an hour and a half. And uh, from then on, whenever I was working for my father-in-law, driving back and forth to West Texas, it's a 16-hour commute just for um, once or twice a week of just driving. So I talked to this guy in Hawaii for two, three, four hours a day uh, just driving down the road, and we just became really good friends. And he was an entrepreneur machinist in Hawaii, the most expensive place in America to live. All he did was run a machine shop, and he supported his family, and it just his, his story is amazing. It's really awesome um, how he got to where he is. But he had a hustle, and he had an ambition to do what he did. And if he moved to anywhere else in America, he could make three times more money. But because he wanted to stay in Hawaii, because that's where his wife, wife's family was from, that's where she wanted to live, that's where he wanted to raise his kids, he had to move a lot of products, he had to make a lot of money to be able to do that. And just his hustle and his ambition and his joy that he had for working for himself, I guess, rubbed off on me. Um, and we ended up working together on a collaboration and we made really good money um, on that project for like a year and a half. And then that kind of died. And Was that those beads? Yeah. 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 And so that, that kind of died and it became certain like I need to do my own thing. I don't need to just work with somebody. I need to do my own thing. So then that's what 
how that ended up happening. It didn't even plan on being a full-time job. I was going to do the beats, and then I was going to do um, the handkerchiefs, and then I was, Mary was also going to do photography. And so we were going to try and do like three things just to make a living with the two of us until we could figure out what did the best. And uh, God was like, in a, in a month and a half of doing the handkerchiefs, where we thought well, that'd be like a quarter of our income, it was like this was blowing up to be more than more than twice of the other ones. So we were like, okay, this is where we need to put all our eggs in one basket. This is the basket that God, uh, God has given us. So we just ran with it, and it just blew up. So that's, that's definitely, I guess, why I wanted to become an entrepreneur. My wife had, had been raised by an entrepreneur, so I guess that's probably what got her that ambition. Um, she w did photography before we did this, and it, photography is a rough game. It's very rough. But yeah, it's all about learned. finding your market. Yeah, yeah. And she, and she tried to do that, and I guarantee you that if she did that now, she'd be able to make it. It's just, it's not where... It would be a diversion from the focus that y'all have already. Right now, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, we've learned a lot doing this business, and we've learned from our mistakes, obviously, because we've had had them. Uh, but if she went back to photography, she'd be able to do well with it. Versus her first shot at it was very rough uh, because it's just a, it's a tough market. If you did go ever have to go back to like a nine to five, mm -hmm. would that be? What would be the worst thing about that? Would that be because, would it be a financial thing, a lifestyle thing? It'd be a means to an end. I would push to get back to working for myself. So even if I worked a nine to five now, because that's, that's on the table. If, if our market tanks, because we are in a very niche market, if our market tanks or something goes bad or if whatever happens, I am 100% willing to go get the first nine to five that I can get and just work my Easter off to be able to provide for my family. But the goal is to push after hours and to make sure my wife is able to maintain what we're doing now to make whatever income she can from that so that we can use that money to invest in something else or whatever whatever God leads us. But I do think that I think that God wants me to be a stay at home dad where I'm able to work from home. Um, Raise your own kids. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be a dad that's there working seventy hours a week and then just there for the weekends. And not really present there because he's so tired from working the seventy hour a week. Uh, so that's I think that's definitely my goal. So where is most of your time going at this point uh, on the business? And like, can, are you trying to outsource more things? It's uh, production. I've got some big contract orders uh, from like the what's, very large. What's the companies. stuff that you do that's most helpful for the business? Because there's obviously In like, going to the trade shows. Last year we went to, um, or my wife went to three trade shows. I went to a total of seven. Uh, Fort Lauderdale during spring break. Uh, shoot. Atlanta in June. Vegas in September. October went to California. November went to New York. December went to um, Kentucky. January I went back to Vegas for another trade show. Um, so it's just constantly I'm I'm on the go making the in person connections. You make those in-person connections, relationships, friendships um, with these large companies, that's how you get in the door. If you're just someone who's texting, somebody who's messaging, somebody who's phone calling, somebody who's Instagram DMing or Facebook PMing, it's just you're never going to break through that door. You've got to be there in person. They've got to remember you. I showed up uh, to a trade show in May that wasn't even related to the knife industry because I knew some of the big knife industry guys were going to be there so that I could be the only person who, from the knife industry that was going to be there yeah only person them. who's saying hey I want to work with you everybody else is saying guns 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 it was an NRA event in Dallas and I was meeting up with Microtech, which is the largest company we currently publicly work with. We were working with some more that we just haven't released yet. But I was went up and I spent the whole day in their booth helping helping them uh, tear down, helping them set up, helping them run it, uh, running errands for people, picking stuff up. Uh, and it's just those kind, types of types of moments are what they remember and make it where even if somebody undercuts us in price, increases their margins, they're not going to go with it because they're not the person that's busting, they trust. busting their back to be able to make sure that their 
like shoot, uh, we went to a trade show in Atlanta, and this market tech guy, uh, before we started working with them, uh, it was in Fort Lauderdale in March. So March, May, we started working with them in September. Uh, in March, uh, I was walking around the show, making sure that people had stuff to eat. I had beef jerky and uh, nuts that I was dropping off to all the people that we work with. That's another thing that we do. Uh, whenever we go to a trade show, and all the people that we work with, we like go get pizza or go get barbecue sandwiches, and we just walk around the show with barbecue sandwiches and ice cold Coca Colas, and just hand them out like cotton candy to the people we work with to make sure that they're fed, they're they're taken care of, that they are. Because that's one of the last things you're thinking of is yourself during these trade shows. So that's one thing that we try and do is the people that we work with really take care of them, the customers that we have we really take care of them. Um, Whenever we started working, our ship shipping, our packages, like we tried our best to figure out mindset-wise, how do we make our package look like a gift, like a present, the opening experience of it. How do we make it stand out and set apart? So we wrapped it in butcher's paper. We wrapped that in hemp. Uh, we put a thank you card that at the beginning Mary was handwriting to each person. Now we have a more generic one printed. And then we had uh, handmade carvels put in there. And we delivered them that way. And then people just ran and raved about it because everybody else was throwing it in a Ziploc bag or just throwing it in the package, not, nothing done to it, and then mailing it off. Uh, but we really took a step back to figure out how do we make our customers' experience of purchasing our product the best? Yeah, because um, at that point, it's not something that costs you a whole bunch of extra money, and it, to them, is really special. It takes special. a full day for us to do shipping. Uh, we ship out 40 to 60 orders, and it takes us a full day to do it because of all the steps that it takes. But it's really what sets us apart and makes it where we have recurring customers. We've got a guy in Cal in, uh in Canada that's got like $6,000 worth of pocket squares from us. And it's just like we've got some people out there that just don't care about any other company other than us because of how we treat them and how we interact with them. Uh, Mary has also spent a lot of time on our website. Uh, we got really good graphic designs by somebody that we spent a lot of money on uh, to make sure our logo was unique, our logo was on brand and stuff like that. So it's just those small details like that really mattered. To, to make it where our business was set apart. Um, so once we got to be the top dog, that's whenever we invested on stuff to make sure that we were leaps and bounds above everybody else. So that even if even if they work as hard as us, they're not going to catch up because we're already we're already five steps down the road. So it sounds like at this point you really don't need especially leading up to the twins. You don't yeah. need an influx of new customers right now because that would mean more less time that you would have available. You need somebody if to free had, up that time so that you can go customers. do more trade shows, right? Yeah, if we had more customers... Um, that would make it worth outsourcing more? We might get some more employees, but then again, like the training process during this pregnancy time is not going to be able to happen. Um, so any changes to the business and like like serious growth would need to happen like six months from now? Or we've, we've talked to one of the ladies that works for us and about training somebody else, and she's okay with that. So we, we could go that route. Um, we'll see how it goes. If God opens up a big door, um, then we're going we're gonna to take it because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, but definitely, we're focusing on the family right now and making sure that that's doing good. Yep. Family's everything. Amen. Yeah. How's your family doing? They're doing well. Um, Amy's in Boston. I don't know if you knew. She's been taking care of my Uncle Steve. He's been going downhill health-wise with dementia. My grandpa's been hit by that. Yeah. So it's getting to the point now to where he's having trouble thinking of the words that he wants to say yeah. to communicate what he means and they're thinking that he has maybe a year or less to live That's rough. Yeah. and he's like I think he's 62 he's really young to have yeah, dementia it is. So, my grandfather's in his 80s he got early on set dementia uh, so Amy's been up there for about the last six months she'll be coming home this summer um, she'll be here for a wedding in a few weeks. Uh, but she's already ready to come home. Yeah. 
Uh, That's rough. No matter how you cut it. Yeah. But it's good that we can have somebody from family go and help take care of him. Yeah. How's Adam? Or uh, Tyler. Adam. Tyler, yeah. He's good. Um, he's been learning a lot about um, online marketing. Still doing the... Still doing the gym. The gym. Yeah. He's been, he's been really focused on marketing because he's, I mean, he's got his expenses covered, like more than covered, so any more students that he can bring in, which he has room for, is just, is just pure profit. Yeah. So um, he, there's a lot of ideas he's always brainstorming. One of them was his summer, changing the name of his boy's summer camp. He used to call it like a boy's gymnastics summer camp. No. Now he calls it ninja class. Yeah. And go all the American Ninja Warrior marketing and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. And all of a sudden, you get you know two, three times more people sign up because every kid, every young boy wants to be a ninja. Yeah. No young boy wants to be a gymnast. No. no. <laughs> so you just call it something else, and you do the exact same stuff that you've been always doing. Tell you them how to do front throw, flips and cartwheels, and you might throw some other other things in it, like yeah, to make it like more interesting. Foam nunchucks and playing around with like buy a gi and put a throwing put a belt stars. on or stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, he's been messing around with Facebook marketing. And his uh, a friend of. Kristen's, his wife, uh, knows a lot about how, how, to, out of how, to do, how to do testing for online marketing yeah. and figure out what works and what doesn't. I've got a lot of friends that they use that and they, they try to give me advice on it, but I, I just don't have time right now. Uh, I think that's also one of the things, if our, if our demand goes down, I'll focus on that um, first. Right. And then go from there because, like, I've got friends. They they throw. Uh, a good friend of mine was throwing fifty percent of his profits into marketing. It's consistent for growing businesses. That's yeah. a good number. But I, I was even for large businesses that are kind of plateaued or slow growth. They still throw ten to twenty percent of their yeah. of their gross income. We were we're throwing nothing in there. We're not doing. We're not playing that game because we don't have to. But if we if we have to, what if what if you doubled your business like within six months? I don't have the ability to keep up with it. I don't, I, I've got the I your problem. Your problem set would change. Yeah, it would change from not having enough time to go do trade shows to where you're like you having you, to have time to find people to work for us. Yeah, right. Because right. yeah. that's what you need right now. You need time to where pe- you can go find more people to take all this stuff off of your plate. That doesn't when our website was selling out in three minutes, we'd get like nasty emails from people because they were upset that they weren't able to get this or weren't able to get that. Those yeah. are those are people that you're not able to help, yeah. and you've solved that problem. That's a now. good thing and a bad thing. It means that you're you're not making as you're, much money. You're going the right direction. Yeah, but you're not doing enough. Yeah, you need to go faster. So now that we have product on the website, we don't have that kind of stuff. We still do very limited runs. Uh, that's the way our mindset is. That's the way our businesses run. We do batches of 12, and once once a batch is gone, it's never made again. So our styles are constantly changing. There's constant in, yeah. well, in there's constantly new, and then once it's gone, it's gone. I've done some uh, marketing consulting with a few different businesses, uh-huh. and they none, none of them have been the same yet. So I'm trying to still trying to figure out what my niche would be. Um, so, like my dad's business, for example. Yeah. I had I had a conversation with him to figure out what he could do, and he's hoping to double his income this year. He's been in business 25 years. Yeah. It's and a like game. A, a half hour conversation that I had with my dad after I learned how to do this stuff. Marketing is it, key. And for him, he didn't have to put any effort into it. It was just a mindset change for him. Yeah. What's valuable? What do I need to focus on? Like like you, that's the type of questions that I'm asking you. What are the things you do? And it's trade shows yeah. that bring in most of your business. You don't need to be making the tags when you are you could you know, be doubling, tripling your business by going to more trade shows. There's no more trade shows, though. I go to every one that I can in my market, in my industry. <laughs> so I, I've tapped that. And I've, with the input that I've done right now, I have sown seeds to be able to like just be done with this industry. 
So the only way for me to grow would be to either go outside of this industry or, like I said, create another business that's in this industry but different. So that's that's why I'm trying to transition to that. And the good thing is, is that I currently work with 60 different companies, so it's not going to be difficult to be able to create 60 different relationships that are me buying product instead of just me sending them royalty checks. Mm -hmm. They're already comfortable with working with me. So in terms of Fox Hanks, you're pretty comfortable with where it's sitting now? Yeah, yeah. We're going to add some more products, like I said, bandanas and more um, do you cheaper think, products. Do you think maybe there's a part of this industry that's untapped that you just haven't reached yet? There's some brands that are still going to take some time to crack, but that's it. The t- as far as like the type of this industry. Oh, no, there are there's some products that are going to take more time for me to get into. Um, not products, but like with what you already have now, are there more? Are there more people out there that you because you haven't been doing any outreach at all? Yeah. Do you feel like you've hit the limit for the organic reach that you have, and now you need to put, be more focused in any like putting, paid putting, advertising, actively putting yourself out there more? Any of that, I think, is going to get people that like it, but are not in this community. So I think in the community that we have, I don't have to pay money to get to get the business. I would be paying money to get people that are not in my community. It would so. be, it would be um, not nece- not guns necessarily, but another reason that people would buy like hats. pins, like, like pins, um, cigar, tuxedo um, shops, and things like that. Pin cigars, kind of deal. That that kind of a world is where the next bubble would be. That's where that's where Facebook's algorithm would put my product next to the people that are buying the high-end pens people that are smoking expensive cigars um i don't think for like for advertising google really doesn't like to just show people stuff for free anymore. no no you have to pay to get facebook to show your stuff to anybody even like your own yeah. followers yeah so but and you can, you can pick all that because yeah like i we can into instagram and say that um before Fox Hanks, my personal account was growing a thousand followers a week, and Fox Hanks's payday was growing a thousand followers a week. That's how we got to twelve thousand followers really fast. Um, we're never gonna hit that thirty thousand bubble unless we pay to play, uh, because it's just not gonna happen. There's Would you be interested in doing that? That number doesn't have any effect on us. The the number of followers. Well, no, not number of followers, yeah. but in terms of like number of products sold, because that's like the the same thing I was talking about with the lady I did the video for. Mm-hmm. The views, it feels great to get three hundred thousand views on something, but if that didn't translate into any long term income, thirty thousand followers business, is not going to increase the amount of money that we make. I don't think. Right. Because no, the ad would have to be targeted at selling more yeah. product, not yeah. getting more followers. It, that's that's what it would have to do. Uh, the only reason why I would run that would be because we're we're not hitting the numbers we need to be able to make a living. Uh, because, like I said, I'm I need to be focusing on other products and I need to be focusing on other avenues. I need to be diversifying my portfolio. Is what it basically basically boils down to. I like I said, I'm in a niche market. So if this niche market dries up, I need to be in something that's bigger than the niche. Not that the niche isn't good. The niches make it good enough money where we're making a living. I wonder if it's something... What if the market doesn't have to grow for you to be able to make more money? What do you mean? What if there's something that you're failing to do that you could... Like like with the, the, the packaging experience that you mentioned. Yeah. What if there were other things, other other things like that, that would cost you very little effort, but you would be able to charge a serious premium? For? We did some of that stuff. Um, so like we did a subscription box, and it was good, and it made it where we made an extra five hundred dollars a month, uh, six hundred dollars a month. Do you have a business goal? Like if there was more market out there? So the goal is these products that are less involved. And then to create products that are more involved, which is going to provide more, increase more staffing and increase more, um, what do you want to call that? Research, planning, uh, prototyping. Market That's, testing, yeah. Pro- market's there. We know it's there for the next line of products. And we, we want to make cases, bags, stuff like that. 
um, pouches. So that's a market we're trying to get into, but we're leaving it until we have the time to invest. We've got some designs that we've talked through and stuff like that, some very rough prototypes that we made, um, and we'll probably either outsource that production or we will um, hire staff that can make it better. Um, but the problem is, is that that requires more machinery than the average person is going to want to invest in, so we're either going to have to buy it ourselves and let them use it, or lease it to them or something. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we want to, to take that leap, but that's the leap we're wanting to take. If you only had to work like one day a week, what would you have to outsource? I would have to outsource uh, the creative side of things, which I don't have anybody that I think that's, has that. That's where most of the yeah most of your time has to go. Yeah. Hmm. And scheduling and planning, and I don't I don't know anybody that can handle that myself. Um, that's looking for a job, and I don't feel comfortable like trying to talk somebody out of a good job because like I don't know if we can maintain that you know well, you would have to you would have to find somebody that's um, currently like they're looking for another job yeah yeah so I, I that hasn't fallen in my lap that's not something and then also if we if we do that then I've got to shell out enough payroll to make it worth their while and then that affects our bottom line but in the long run it is a positive but it's also it's a leap that I'm not comfortable taking yet I don't think I want to just like I'm a hard-headed guy that wants to just muscle through it myself. There's a there's an email list that I signed up for. Mm -hmm. um, this guy just sends out tips. And I've never found anybody else that says the type of stuff that this guy talks about. Yeah. Um, he he had somebody give him an example of uh, mowing somebody's lawn. Yeah. All right. So here's a story. The only grass area left to mow is the verge outside my house. There's a guy who comes in regularly to mow the lawns and verge for the rental properties next door. He mows about a third of the verge section up to our boundary. The next time he's there, I'm going to find out how much he'll charge to do the entire area. It'll take him maybe two minutes. But I would happily pay him $30, maybe more, not to lose the 20 minutes to, to 30 minutes it takes me to get organized to go do it, plus the cognitive load of changing my mindset, pulling away from my work, and knowing it needs to be done by having not done it. And then somebody, this is a, an online conversation, somebody said, if that's all the grass, it also means that you can get rid of your mower, your mixed gas, save the space in your shed, skip yeah. the maintenance. And the guy says, exactly, the space in the shed will make a huge difference. It's a really small shed. Yeah, you're not paying for his 7 to 10 minutes. You're paying to save your 20 minutes, plus all the stress, planning, materials, shed space, maintenance, etc. And so the guy gives an update a couple days later. He said, the grass mowing guy turned up today, so I put my plan into action. I had to use business concepts that he was not familiar with to get on board. He was struggling to see how he could charge anything sensible for three minutes of his time. And I could see him feeling like the only option was to do it for free, but not wanting... To do so. So I highlighted for him that it was, for him it was three minutes, but for me it saved half an hour. He immediately got that there was a practical amount of money that he could charge because of that. He offered me a fixed monthly fee paid directly hit to his bank account, and now he'll mow the verge whenever he comes and it needs it, usually twice a month, three times in the spring. Yeah. Cost, seven dollars. We're both happy. And it's all because I clearly understood the value of what I was asking somebody else to do. Yeah. I wonder for you, what type of processes do you have in place to ask your customers how good of a job are we doing? Is there anything we can we do better? We have a review system. We have like a bunch of reviews. Do you have people saying that I would pay $100 for these things or I would pay $40? Or do you ever get any kind of response like that? Uh, we have a lot of people that say it's worth the price point. Um, I don't feel comfortable charging more. We're already at the top end. Well, who spectrum. decides who decides what your handkerchiefs are worth, you or your customers? Our customers, yeah. So do you think it'd be a good idea to ask them what they would pay for it? Like, honestly, what they would pay for it and be comf and be happy to pay? Yeah. The threshold of what they would be happy to pay? I don't know. Wouldn't, yeah. now, now, so this is another thing I, I see a lot of people, and I have, I have trouble with this too even still. I would feel uncomfortable asking people to pay me large amounts of money. Yeah. If I work for somebody for free, does that help? Does that enable me to help future customers? 
Mm -hmm. No, it, it doesn't, because now I don't have any money. I can't put that into the business. It's not sustainable, so eventually I would go out of business. I think we're already at the top tier of our price point. I don't think the market would handle handle any more adjustment to that. I would say I would check with your customers about that. They might. Yeah. It might that you you might be right. You might be right. You've got a pretty good feel because you're coming from the same background that they are. Yeah. Knife collecting, yeah. guns, all that type of stuff. You you get what's important to these people. The, the finesse, the feel, the packaging of things, the, all that, the whole experience. Because mm -hmm. at a certain point, when you're buying a $3,000 knife, you, you're not cutting things with it at that well, the, point. Well, the branded stuff is different. I think the branded stuff could have a price adjustment, but I think our just standard plain Jane, I think it's at the, at the north end of the price points that it can figure out Figure out what's important, like really important, detailed conversations. And maybe, I, I hope you already do this. Yeah. What's, what it's really worth to the brands, how much revenue is it bringing into them, and charge based on that. Um, it's marketing. It's just like a T-shirt kind of. There video. are a lot of things that people charge a whole lot of money for. Yeah. They mark way, way up because there's a huge demand for it, and that enables them to invest more into the infrastructure mm -hmm. of that and guarantee it for the future. That's why 5G is coming down the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Because they have crazy good margins on 4G, and they're like, well, people are paying a lot for 4G. That means we can invest more into upgrading it and making it better. So charging more money now is a long-term thing for your customers, you know, five years from now. Yeah. And if I've, I've talked to a lot of business owners that they feel like they shouldn't charge so much, even, and it's actually hurt their customers. Somebody, she was a massage therapist, somebody went and got a surgery they didn't need because she didn't charge them enough money. They needed a $25,000 surgery, but they said, well, well, try this massage therapist. So they go and they look and they say, oh, it's only $60? That can't possibly solve my $25,000 problem. Yeah, yeah. And so they go and get a surgery and it makes it worse. Then they come back to Lori, they pay her $60, and she's able, through therapy and several sessions, to get them back to better than they were before the surgery. Still not back to 100%, but by not charging enough money, she made her customer perceive her as not... Not, not valuable. Good. Yeah, I think we we're on the north. And it there's hurt, nobody and it hurt her customer. Anymore. She got a surgery she didn't need and was out twenty five grand. Yeah, there's no other company that charges the same amount that we do. We're on the north end of it. I, I look at it um, in markets. I study like alcohol, cigars, stuff like that as well. Uh, like behind you, there's bottles of alcohol. The, the same thing with you, just as drunk. But it's how much money you're going to spend for it. You look at uh, Pappy Van Winkle, and you're spending like thirty to three hundred dollars for a shot, versus you can get a whole bottle for five bucks somewhere. So it's just the branding. It's the it's what your customers what experience, value. right? Yeah. Because um, there's another thing this guy sent in an email talking about duck calls. Yeah. Or, no, 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 not duck calls. Duck key, duck decoys. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the most crafted wooden duck decoy? Do you know what the most expensive duck decoy that's ever sold? Do you know what that price was? Twenty-five k or eight hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Yeah. And most people will go. Well, you can get a pack of twelve at Walmart for forty bucks. Yeah. What What gives? Those people that are buying them are not buying them for the same reasons and motivations. I went skeet shooting with a guy with a sixty thousand dollar shotgun. Mine was six hundred bucks. Six hundred bucks. They both still kill a lot ducks. Of money. Yeah. They both kill stuff. Yeah. But it's what's important to the person. It's the feeling and the emotion that's tied up. That's why I bought an expensive watch. Yeah, I like I it. Yeah. 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 Does the Timex if, take, take, keep time just as well? Yeah. If if life is all about just the absolute what you need, everybody should live in a in a house that's big enough to lie down in and have a tube of food piped into the room that they eat that doesn't taste like anything. And ride a bicycle. And you can technically, sur you can survive. Yeah. Most people, I mean, people that are not in America, things we think of as like, oh, gosh, I've got to have this to function. People think of that as an luxury. incredibly luxury. Yeah. Luxury. And it's all relative and it's all based on perception. Yeah. And understanding the emotional reasons why people buy things. And it sounds like just coming out of that background, you had already sort of tapped into that from day one. Yeah, hundred percent. It's a. I'm wondering experience. if you can do more of that. Mm -hmm. At, survey your customers. Chick Fil A does a really good job. Like, they'll if you take a survey, they give you a four dollar sandwich for taking a survey. There are other places they'll give you like a roll, which costs them five cents. Yeah. Because they don't value their customers' opinions, but Chick Fil A, 
when I fill out a survey for Chick-fil-A, like, I'm really thinking, because I get a free sandwich. I get a free meal. Yeah, yeah. Just off of one survey. And it's a it's a thing now at Chick-fil-A where it's like the, ca- the person working the register congratulates you if it happens to give you a survey on your receipt. You got a survey, you know? Congratulations. Because yeah. they really value their customer's opinion. And Chick-fil-A is the number one fast food restaurant in the United States. Yeah. I would probably pay more if they up the prices for their food. I would probably pay 15 bucks for a sandwich and a salad instead of 11 bucks. I'd probably still go there. Their salads are really good. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I'm encouraged. All this good. stuff is very theological. Yeah. It's like, how do you serve other people? How do you give of yourself and make other people's lives better in ways that are important to them? That's cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's good, good to see you, see Michael. You. Yeah. Tell Mary hey. Will do. Let us know if you need anything with uh, yeah. the kids. Yeah. I will.